Hi, Catherine. Hi, Joan. <laughs> How you doing? Good, thanks. I hope. I hope I'm gonna. I hope you're gonna enjoy today. Nice seeing you. Nice to see you. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. Hi, Kathy. Susan. Hi, Susan. That's my cousin, y'all. <laughs> Hi, cousin. Hello, Congratulations, Susan. Kathy. Thank you. Oh, wow. Proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> Cindy, oh good Hello. <laughs> Catherine, can you hear me? Good Teresa. 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 That's one of my genealogy bloggers in New York. Yay. Okay. And uh, the cousin is in California. Nice. Yes. So just, just to remind everyone, aside from Catherine's circle, um, please keep yourselves muted. And um, once we start, please, everyone, keep yourselves muted. Um, There'll be plenty of time for Q&A. I suspect we're gonna to try to end up doing that via the chat room, given how many people are right. gonna be here, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. So anyway, we'll wait a couple more minutes and then we will start. So just hang on or talk to Catherine for the moment, that's fine. You can chit chat. <laughs> well, hey, uh, Lauren, make sure you enable screen sharing with me. Oh, I don't know you wanted that. We can do that Where, if, I can, if I can find you. Um, um, I'm Pat and Joan. <laughs> okay, you should be good now, Ronan. Okay, cool. Okay, this and this is Leela Hawkins just saying hello to everybody. From I'm from the Lakeville Journal, just checking in and saying hello. And now I'll mute myself. So I thank you. All right, you looking for forward to it. Thank you. This is Candace Jackson, Catherine Overton's daughter, saying hello to everyone. Thank you for joining Hi. us. Oh, and the great grands. Yeah. Oh, hi. Oh, where is it? I can't see their picture though. I know, I'm sorry. We are oh, that's okay. not going to be able to join by video today. We'll be okay. listening intently. Hi, Candace. Hi. Hi, hi grandbabies. <laughs> All right. And hello, hello. I don't know hello. if you. And you Our have friends. to mute, you have to mute them, Trina. <laughs> after a minute, there, we're getting ready. We're, we're going to start. All right, Lawrence. I think we're good. Yes, I I agree. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the virtual Scoville Library. Uh, very happy to have this uh, presentation today. I'm still admitting a few more people, so if I sound slightly distracted, I may be. I know most of you know me. Catherine's relatives and friends don't. I am Lawrence Davis Hollander. I am the program coordinator for the Scoville Memorial Library. So welcome one and all. I uh, just want to give you a heads up of a couple of, well, this is sort of the end of our uh, 2020 uh, program season, uh, but just to give you a heads up on a couple upcoming programs after the new year, uh, we are going to have Tehama M. Lopez Bunyasi, whose book, uh, Stay Woke, A People's Guide to Making All Black Lives Matter, uh, will be on Thursday, January 7th. Uh, in the afternoon is the only time we could get her. Um, she's pretty popular. So that'll be a little after New Year's. And then uh, in, in honor of uh, New Year's, so to speak, uh, we, we're going to have uh, uh, program on uh, how to get organized and stay organized with an organizer. And then that following weekend, I think it's about January 16th, uh, American Sinai, uh, how the burnt over district remade our nation and world. This is with Mitch Horowitz. Um, and those are all the programs that uh, I'll talk about right now. So today, I think you all know why you're here. We've got a, a really a fascinating story um, and it kind of in a interview back and forth fashion uh, with Ronan McCriskey. A lot of you probably know him, but he is at Salisbury School and with uh, the Caesar family descendant and the kind of historian, uh, Catherine Overton. And uh, we really welcome her and it's, it's she's done an amazing amount of research on this fairly important history to our immediate region so um thank you for both being here and uh as i said we'll have question and answer at the end 
and you guys can take it away. So uh, thank you all. Thank you very much, Lawrence. And uh, I want to thank all of you for showing up. I mean, uh, this is not uh, just black history. This is American history. And um, I, first of all, want to, um, you know, this is about going back at my training is not that I'm new to this beat. So this is not my, my, uh, particularly area of, of expertise by any stretch, but I've been, I've been sprinting trying to catch up um, because I feel like 2020 is all about going back in our past and expanding our historical irises and looking for, looking for color um, and, and, and history that's often been ignored uh, or forgotten or, or intentionally buried. Um, and so Salisbury School, I wanna thank them first and foremost because they let me teach uh, this course. And, and then I want to thank my students, and you'll see a little of their work later, uh, for, for being excited about this learning and, and presenting this learning in, in new ways. Um, I want to thank two people in particular. I want to thank Peter Vermillier, who uh, many of us locals know as, as the dean of this history. Um, before I even started, I had a cup of coffee with Peter, and, and uh, I was barely crawling at that point, and now I think I'm just jogging. Peter's been sprinting on this beat for a long time. And I also want to thank Gene McMillan, um, because Jean's the one, when I first called her this summer, she said, that's the one you might want to talk to. And that's my, my dear friend now, Catherine Overton. And, and, and knowing Catherine and working with Catherine is like being in a graduate level seminar one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I learn so much every day. Um, so I say that uh, as a way to excite you, but I also say that as a caution because um, Catherine is so fascinating and she's so wise and she can go down a million different rabbit holes. Um, and they're all fascinating. You want to listen to all of it. But we have a very, we have like 300 years of history to tell in 45 minutes. And at the end of the 45 minutes, we'll open it up for questions. Um, I think I'll, we'll try maybe before the chat box. If you, if you, if I call on you, if you raise your hand, I call on you. That might be a good way to do it. Um, but, but save your questions for the end, or maybe if you need to remember, we could type them in the chat box. But um, I'm, I'm hoping to call people um, by, by name when we get to the end. Um, so without further ado, let, let's begin. And it begins with this, this, this mystery, this tease. This was something that Catherine came up with that I thought was great. And you can read it there, the We Know Black African Citizens, the date, um, and the Appalachian Trail Caesar Brook campsite. Uh, the answer to that is, of course, the Caesar family. Um, and so uh, this is the next thing I want to show. Is this still screen sharing? Can you still see this? Yep. This is a little introduction to the Caesar family. The Caesar family was a freed black family who lived in the northwest corner of Connecticut around 1805. It was rare to have a freed black family living in this area at this time. Ms. Catherine Overton helped us in researching how our local communities were built by people of all colors. Mr. McCriskey organized a Zoom meeting between our group and Catherine Overton. Catherine Overton is a relative of the Caesar family through many generations. Speaking to her gave us a better perspective on what hard work and perseverance can do when it comes to caring about the ancestors that came before you. Earlier in the year, my classmates and I were able to choose a subject to build our project around. I was excited when my neighbors chose the same one I did, the Caesar family. To be able to work with my friends and engage with someone who is living connection to history feels important. I was thrilled to be able to hear stories about her family and get a perspective on their lives. One of the most useful tools that we had for our research was Ancestry.com census records. In the 1850 census, Titus and George Caesar are recorded living with many other Caesars on separate but adjacent households. Along with the plethora of facts that Mrs. Overton shared, it was very cool to listen to someone speak about their ancestry, which they are so proud of. The passion in her voice and emotion behind her words made it clear this was something she truly cared about. Because of this, we'd like to thank you, Mr. McCrissy, for setting that up, as it was very cool to see. While on the Caesar Lane, looking at the barn, in the smaller pen section, the foundation was built with smaller, more round stones as if it was built quicker. But looking at the rest of the barn, you can see that there are larger, more square, flat stones. It looks like they took their time with that. What's up, everyone? We are here today at the Caesarbrook campsite for the second time. Um, I, we are currently standing in what we believe was the Caesar family house or maybe a cellar of some sort. We think just because there's this rock wall here behind us. 
And then on top of that, there's also dirt built up over here. And so yeah, overall, we're here at the metal detector, looking for some things, see what we can find. On one of our hikes to the Caesar family campsite, we brought a metal detector to see if we could find anything that the Caesar family may have owned. On that hike, we found metal that we believed to be from a barrel that the Caesar family may have used. Slides or a video here, because it's not happening. Hi, like Parker said, we're here at the Caesar Brook campsite today, and we believe this is a road that George Caesar might have used to get in and out of the town of Sharon uh, to get food and supplies. It is important to know that African-American families who have lived here have been here since at least the early 1800s. Black Lives Matter, Black History Matters, local Black History Matters. Hey, we can't see the video. Black and invisible citizens. They get left out of our histories. As Americans, we all should know our history. And, and show it from the beginning so we can see what's going on here. Hey, so wait, I'm sorry, the video cut out. You weren't able to see it? Yep. It's not oh. moving. There is no video. No, there was no video. Was Right. Screen wasn't shared. Let me uh, let me go back. It was shared, but no, the screen, no, the screen was let's shared. hear from Catherine. Why? All right. Do you want to do that, Catherine? What would you prefer to do? Would you like to go back and watch the video, or? Yes, watch yes. You want to hear that the video is very significant, and the boys worked oh, very hard on it. It's story. a great interview. All right, to all go right, all right. Talk. So who's in charge of the video? We're working on it. We're 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 working on it. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Can you see it now? We can see a picture of, we see the picture that you had on the slide. You can't see this, huh? Now you're, I don't see you click, I don't see the video, you know, don't see the video starting. That's just the picture. How about now? Mm, now? Yes. That okay. looks like it's coming in. Okay. That's it. Okay, I got it. Family was a freed black family who lived in the northwest corner of Connecticut around 1805. It was rare to have a freed black family living in this area at this time. Ms. Catherine Overton helped us in researching how our local communities were built by people of all colors. Mr. McCriskey organized a Zoom meeting between our group and Catherine Overton. Catherine Overton is a relative of the Caesar family through many generations. Speaking to her gave us a better perspective on what hard work and perseverance can do when it comes to caring about the ancestors that came before you. Earlier in the year, my classmates and I were able to choose a subject to build our project around. I was excited when my neighbors chose the same one I did, the Caesar family. To be able to work with my friends and engage with someone who is living connection to history feels important. I was thrilled to be able to hear stories about her family and get a perspective on their lives. One of the most useful tools that we had for our research was Ancestry.com census records. In the 1850 census, Titus and George Caesar are recorded living with many other Caesars on separate but adjacent households. Along with the plethora of facts that Mrs. Overton shared, it was very cool to listen to someone speak about their ancestry, which they are so proud of. The passion in her voice and emotion behind her words made it clear this was something she truly cared about. Because of this, we'd like to thank you, Mr. McCrissy, for setting that up, as it was very cool to see. While on the Caesar Lane, looking at the barn, in the smaller pen section, the foundation was built with smaller, more round stones, as if it was built quicker. But looking at the rest of the barn, you can see that there are larger, more square, flat stones. It looks like they took their time with that. What's up everyone? We are here today at the Caesarbrook campsite for the second time. 
Um, I, we are currently standing in what we believe was the Caesar family house or maybe a cellar of some sort. We think it's because there's this rock wall here behind us. And then on top of that, there's also dirt built up over here. And so yeah, overall we're here at the metal detector looking for some things to see what we can find. On one of our hikes to the Caesar family campsite, we brought a metal detector to see if we could find anything that the Caesar family may have owned. On that hike, we found metal that we believed to be from a barrel that the Caesar family may have used. Hi, like Parker said, we're here at the Caesar Brook campsite today. And we believe this is a road that George Caesar might have used to get in and out of the town of Sharon uh, to get food and supplies. It is important to know that African American families who have lived here have been here since at least the early 1800s. Black lives matter, black history matters, local black history matters. Up until now, black people have been invisible citizens. They get left out of our histories. As Americans, we all should know our history. Okay, sorry about that guys. We practiced that too, right Catherine? All right, so here we have the Caesar family. Why don't you take it away, Catherine? Unmute yourself, my friend. Okay, I have technical assistance here. Uh, yes, we, uh, we put together a timeline of the family as far back as uh, Timothy Caesar and coming forward to my mother, Ray Williams, and the person at the top, we believe to be uh, the family progenitor, Rachel Caesar. And we'll talk about that a little later. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get more on her later. All right, so the story starts with the patriarch. What are we looking at here, Catherine? This is a personal uh, framed document and portrait that I have at home on my wall. Uh, the first side, the left side is a presidential memorial, official presidential memorial certificate signed by President Barack Obama uh, during his last year of office. And I was waiting uh, with, as they say, bated breath because I had sent the letter in like at least a year earlier and it took a while. I'm sure he was signing other things, but that is an official uh, presidential memorial to hit in um, honor of his, in recognition of devoted and selfless con conservation to the service of our country and the armed forces. And, and what, what's the picture on the right? The picture is a painting that I uh, purchased from the historic artist uh, Don Toriani of a sixth Connecticut soldier. And they actually, there's actually a unit of, there were, there's a regiment called Sixth Connecticut and they, it consisted of mostly African-Americans. Are there and any, honestly, yes. Are there any notable guests that are also honorary members of the sixth regiment? <laughs> oh, I'm glad you asked. That's what <laughs> me. <laughs> Yes, they were so gracious as to allow me to become a member. And uh, I have a certificate. I didn't put that picture up, but that's also on the wall that they sent me uh, next to that nearby that I'm an honorary member of the 6th Connecticut Regiment of Reenactors. And if you go to their website, you'll actually see, I didn't know they had changed their, their, their page. They, they, they put me on the cover, me and Timothy in the grave on the cover of their, um, on the first page of their website. Okay, uh, cool. The fix, they also, you go to the Facebook page, you will see they have posted the video from the ceremony we had last year in honor of Timothy Caesar. So Timothy Caesar was a Revolutionary War vet from originally New York, mustered in Haddam, fought with Washington along the uh, Hudson. And then you have this, this, porch, this, uh, this painting here, not this painting, this, this display here, but I'm really encouraging you to change the display. What else do you have? Oh, I think if you scroll, well, when we get down further, you'll see a copy, uh, uh, a photocopy. There it is. Um, this is something I found on, during one of my, mm, I, have, I have research moments that come to me and um, use this late at night and a question will come to mind and I'll just sit at the computer and start searching. And I came up with a picture. Somehow, this was after the ceremony, 
I came up with this document that was on the Swan um, Gallery's auction site. They were, had, had had a um, auction in the, the month before, so it had been sold. But I contacted the manager of that, the material, uh, I think that was the, uh, the section that, that has manuscripts and documents. And I said, I asked about, you know, the, the document. And he said, oh, it has been sold. And we, we chit-chatted and he said, well, I can't tell you who bought it. But uh, what I'll do is I'll email the, the, the owners and see if they're willing to, you know, share a picture. So he did that, got back, and not only did they share a picture, the guy, the owner said, I have a friend who has another one. So I actually ended up saying, having sent to me photos of two of these, and, and one of them has the, the back of it, which shows the signature where they put the X. That was another, I tell you, I was telling Ron, and I'm going to call those the aha uh -huh moments. Uh, I was blown away. All right, so let me ask you a little bit about that because that, that'll be important. That'll be a theme as we work through the, uh, this afternoon. Okay. Um, you, you heard these stories as a young girl from your mother, right? You didn't have any documentary evidence of it, right? But you, were, you, were, you, you, you heard stories of an indigenous woman who was the matriarch. You heard stories of a vet who was, uh, helped fought in the Revolutionary War. So at the end of that ceremony, and you saw a picture of Catherine in front of the tombstone at the Grove Street Cemetery in New Haven, at the end of the cemetery, a documentary maker, a film friend of yours came up to you and said, um, Catherine, I'm, I'm asking you, like, when was the first time you were proud to be an American? And you gave an answer at the time that you weren't really thinking about. Then later you went back and edited it. Will you talk about that? <laughs> yes. Um, I contacted, before I, I uh, finalized the, uh, the, the uh, ceremony with the Sixth Connecticut, I was trying to reach out for other people who might be interested in attending because I didn't want to be there by myself. You know, I, I came up on the train and I knew they were going to be there and I know it was open to the public. It had been advertised in the paper, but I just wasn't sure if anybody was going to be there. So um, I reached out to Frank Harris III, who is a, uh, a journalist with the Hartford Current. And I knew that I'd read some of his materials and I knew that he was also interested in stories like this, black history. And, I, and, and he offered to come and he said, well, if I come, I wanna bring my two daughters because I want them to know this too. And he said, would you mind if I uh, take videotape or interview? That's what he said, interview me. And I said, mm, again, I'm thinking, what do you mean? Are you gonna put me on camera on the TV or something? Anyway, I'm, I'm a little shy of that. And he said, no, I just wanna, you know, I might take a couple of pictures. Well, as it turns out, he got, he brought his video, he brought his tripod, his, his equipment, and he was all over the place taking these, all this beautiful uh, footage, which ended up being put into a, a, a sort of another mini documentary about the service. And uh, it's posted on his uh, YouTube pay, uh, page. It's about seven, 10 minutes, it, but with the, uh, the ceremony itself was over an hour. So he got the best of it and put it in a video and it's called Private Timothy Caesar. And it's on YouTube on his channel, um, Frank Harris. And so, Catherine, you, so, so talk about what it means to be a proud Black American citizen. Was well, what if, uh, you know, we've always, and, and the answer to the question you asked me before was, you know, I said, I, I, when, when I, top of my head, I said, oh, I guess when Barack Obama was elected president. And then I went home and I thought, oh, I didn't mean that. So I called him. I said, look, you got to change that. If you're putting it in a video, I said, I've always been a proud American. I said, it's been, we've had a, a long history in our family of veterans who fought from the Revolutionary War all the way up through world, all the world wars. And possibly now I do know one that was serving over in the, uh, the, uh, the Middle East. Hmm. So, you know, we, we, I've always been proud to be American. So Timothy Caesar was the Revolutionary War veteran. Tell us about uh, his mother, Rachel. Okay. Now, um, I, this is again, this is where you have a let's let's think of this as um, oral history was what I had to start with. Okay. I started with the oral history that had been passed along and not been hearing about, but I wasn't paying attention too much. And then after my mother passed, I realized that uh oh, you know, I should have asked questions more. Well, I better get in, you know, and start researching. And I um, did uh, find out that actually oral history has it that um, Rachel, uh, my, my, her, his mother was a Native American. And the surprising thing about that is I also met a cousin who's on the call, hi Regina, uh, in, at the uh, ceremony in the, la the year before at the uh, induction ceremony for William Grimes, the, the author of the first fugitive slave. And Regina Mason who's on has a film about that called Gina's Journey. And in her book, that she signed for me. 
I saw uh, an entry that said that Rachel Caesar was Timothy Caesar's uh, daughter. So that was another thread. I'm, what I'm doing is knitting threads. That, that's how you have to, when you go that far back in African-American yeah. history, you don't see the documents that you, you usually find. So I just started finding threads here and there. And eventually you, you see a name, you'll see a naming pattern as we go down. You'll see a naming right. pattern. So, 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 you know, I think an important point to make here is that um, documentation for indigenous folks, doc documentation for black folks, you know, it was spotty, inaccurate. It was difficult. And yet here you did, you, through your persistence, you found a document from 1789 that, taught, that has Rachel by name. Will you talk about that aha moment? Okay, that aha, aha moment, I think I had this, I don't know. Anyway, uh, that I found on archives.org and I scrolled in, you know, I queried for her name and, uh, you know, only two pages came up. This one was from 79, 1789 January. This is a document where the uh, Massachusetts uh, courts keep records of people who were being taken care of by the by the uh, the uh, town. She was living in Dartmouth. She was living in the town of Dartmouth, and um, so it lists everybody's name and what they did for them. And then on the right side, you'll see the the little numbers. Those are in they're not in dollars, the pounds, and you know the colonial do dollars. And so they they mentioned that Rachel Caesar to the town, okay, number 78 says, to the town of Dartmouth for boarding, and a couple of other names, Patience Joel, and it says from to, and then it says, I think that arrow is up, up too high. The arrow's in the sec, should be on the yeah, second line. Yeah, it's a little line. high, so it should be right there. Yeah. yeah, to boarding Rachel Caesar, another Indian pauper. So uh, from the 6th of, I can't see that, but it's 1790, January 1790. So it looks like she was on, you know, was being taken care of as a as a poor person. But I don't, I don't, I, I wasn't surprised by that. I was surprised to see her name and finally see documentation that she was Native American. But I did not, you know, know anything about her other than, you know, that she was the uh, was the matriarch. I mean, the progenitor. Pro and that wasn't the only documentation. You you had both of these as well. Yes. Oh, yes. I found this. Actually, I have phases I go through when I'm doing research. So I started with answers like most people do. And then I, and I actually then I went to archives and whatnot. This I found on doing newspaper. I was in a, a phase of doing newspaper research. So you go back in time and you find it. And I believe I, I no, I didn't find this on. The, some of you'll see later. I got some off the, of the Lakeville Journal. So <laughs> I, I think the amazing research. thing about this, Catherine, is look, look at the years that look at look at how long she lived. Oh, these are two death notices that were printed in two of the uh, earlier uh, colonial um, uh, newspapers. I believe it was in Dartmouth. I'm not sure, but it says she died at, at, in Dartmouth. She, this one, the first one says she was a, a black woman, age 104, 104 years. And the second one says, that's at the bottom. At says the bottom, it's a little blurred out. It says 100. Yeah, uh, uh, at Dartmouth, uh, Rachel Caesar, age 100. So, so she, she lived a long time. She lived a long time. Yeah, in, in the 1699, quite quite likely. Yes, and keep that name in mind because you're going to see it. We'll come times. back to that name. So this might be familiar to locals. This is the um, Town Hill Cemetery on the Hotchkiss campus. And this is where the story turns to Salisbury because Timothy's son, um, Titus, we know was a landowner in Salisbury. We have a document that ties him back here to 1805, a property record, but it probably even stretched before that. Um, so Catherine got in her car, came up here with her zip drives and her mini computer and her portable printer to visit the various local history, his, uh, his, history town, hall. town halls and, and historical societies. Um, and yeah. she came by this grave and wasn't able to find Titus Caesar's grave, even though, even though she knew it was in there. And she was heading home, so she decided one last time. Why don't you tell this story, Catherine? Okay, so I'd come, I'd come the day before after speaking with Jean, Jean McMillan. Say hi, Jean. And uh, she had directed me to, you know, the cemetery and gave, 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 given me a little background on it. And I went there and I, I walked around and I walked around and I couldn't, I couldn't see them. I couldn't see where they were. A lot of those headstones are very um, blurred, you know, over time. And I, I left. And the next day, I, I, I think I called Jean maybe or emailed her and I said, I didn't find the graves. And she told me to go back, thank God for the recommendation. She told me that, well, try again, go back and take your time and walk and look, you know, slowly because it's a small cemetery. So on my way out the next morning, I packed up, I'm ready to get on the road. I said, okay, I'm gonna stop by one more time. I walked through, I knew the ones I already knew had seen. And I started back to my car because I, I really thought I wasn't gonna find them. And so I got to my, to, I started seeing one that had a C on it. 
because it's still a little worn. And then I saw an E, and then I saw an S, and then I saw an A and an R. And I said, and I saw Titus is under there. And I said, and I fell on my knees. This is true. It's a true story. I fell on my knees. I had you the flowers you see there, I brought with me. I placed those on. I fell on my knees and I said, I found you. <laughs> so I said, I know the people in the little house that's there's a house over there somewhere. Uh, uh, I said, I know those people are looking outside saying, what is that crazy black woman doing I'm down on her knees? I'm sure they said something like that. <laughs> so then, uh, so we know Titus was here. We know Titus was a landowner in Salisbury. And then we know George, his son, bought land in Sharon. So talk about this, what we're looking at here, Catherine. Okay, this is a snapshot of the 1850 census showing George L. Caesar on the first line, as you can see, and, and his, some of his other, oh, his wife, Eleanor Caesar. And uh, there's an adopted person there that was 14 that was living there. Um, and then below that, in another household, there's Titus Caesar, his father, Margaret Caesar, his wife, and a Jane A. Caesar at that time, um, who's also, I believe, I believe all of them, those, the Titus family, all of them are in the cemetery too, well, along with Titus. Catherine, I um, want to talk about this badass here, Dinah Dina oh, Caesar. I forgot, the third line shows an, an uh, adult female who also has property. It's worth $100, but she owns property, a black woman uh, in 1850, and she's, in, she's listed as her own household. So I'm thinking, I, you know, I can't, say for sure but i because of the family grouping and i've seen it on other censuses i believe that might be his sister based on the age you can see the 70 he's 70 and she's 73 i believe that's his his sister because so catherine stayed in the family if they got older as they got older so so one of the mysteries is how titus ended up in salisbury way up in northwestern connecticut and and the the clue might be down here at the bottom of here the bissells you want to talk about that and the conjecture uh oh. Well, actually they were born, as you can see on the right hand side, um, I believe T Timothy was born in New York. That's very, that's that's something I already know. Timothy was born in, 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 and I believe Titus, as you can see, New York and Dinah. So I believe, you know, that's the brother and sister that came in with, with Titus from New York. They settled in, you know, up in Salisbury at that time, which was a very busy, you know, industrious uh, town. Now, um, at some point, okay, so we're going from New York to, okay. So I'm going back to Timothy, the link between Timothy or no, the link it, between... Look at the, the Bissell name down here. On oh, the yes, bottom. yes, yes. We, yeah, we, we did want to say that um, the Bissell, they were obviously, for, you know, living right next to, you know, the, the Bissell property. They, they're buried in the Bissell family cemetery. That cemetery was originally part of the Bissell family when, before Mrs. Marie Bissell um, Hotchkiss donated the land for the school, the Hotchkiss school. Um, so I would say that they probably were very well acquainted. I'm sure they did some type of work for them at some point, you know, as, you know, he, as they had their own land, but they still probably may have done some, some work for them. And I think they were probably well connected with them. They were, you know, very, I, I think they probably might have been people who would have facilitated helping them, you know, to establish themselves. Okay, so this is in Sharon. What grave is this, Catherine? Oh, this is Hill, Hillside? Oh, Hillside. so... I can't because I can't see the screen on where the other side on the right side what you'll see is a, a the the earlier I'd say from the 1800s that is a gravestone that is on, on in hillside it's and the name on it is John Caesar that was uh, a one of the sons of George but there were also other people in there because there's a record on it, a Sharon Historical Society shared with me oh I also thank Sharon Historical Society they they gave me a lot of information when I came to see them um, but uh, they, they told me where the grave was. And then I, I looked on their website under their genealogy page and they had lists of names that were buried there. So there were many other people in the Caesar family that were buried there, but the only one headstone that said John. At some point, I believe this was 2014. I went, to, I went to Sharon in 2011. I came to Salisbury in 2014. I went over to Sharon again. But I believe that gravestone was put in recently because it's a granite, it's totally out of place there. It's not a historic marker. It's totally, it's a granite pink stone. You know, I didn't see any more like that. And someone chiseled the names of George Caesar, his wife, Eleanor, and four of their children, and Andrew, Mary, Pratt, and Ward, my great grandfather. And John Caesar's on there too, but he has his, the, old, the headstone over there is the original probably one. So that's a local history mystery. If anyone has any information on that, get in touch with us. Over this 1870 census, 
Yes, we're just we're we're just kind of giving a slope coming down to uh going up down the timeline, and right. we're this is the 1870. So 20 years later, you still see George Caesar in Salisbury. Right. Uh, uh, I think yeah. that's that's the same. Is that the that looks like the same? No, there's that's the that, I think that's the uh, wider version of that. Oh, okay, so, okay. All right, yeah. now my favorite slide. Uh, yes. All right, so okay. so will you read what this says because it's a little blurry here. It, it, um, sure. So this was a broadside and broadsides were kind of like public advertisements. So this would have been put up downtown in a place where the public can see. Um, and it's the date, it's advertising a celebration for July 4th, 1870, a really important date. Yes. Remember what it says, Catherine? Yes, and I was trying to get, the, I, I actually have it typed up in, uh, in a brochure that I sent out to the family. Uh, back you in know the this, you don't, you don't need the, the typed up. You, you, okay, I've heard I know it. okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, it says, it's dated 4th of July, 1870. Once more, we noble African citizens will gather at the house of George L. Caesar on Sharon Mountain to hold the 4th of July in celebration of the 15th Amendment. White persons of respectability will be treated well. And so then he I gives actual directions to the house down there. It's a little blurry, but I typed up the directions so I could try to find out where it was. <laughs> Yeah, directions are pretty good, right? Directions would get us. They turn out to be very, very accurate. And and you know, I, I think the, the when you the juxtaposition of this against the famous Frederick Douglass speech is what is the July Fourth to a black man? Well, we know what July Fourth, eighteen seventy, with the passing of the Fifteenth Amendment meant. What did that mean, Catherine? Well, that was a, a huge day. That was when African or black men were finally uh, given the right to vote after having it taken away. Timothy's right with vote, that, that fought with the revolution. His right was taken away, uh, and it, 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 in Connecticut, from what I understand, twice people uh, there was a, an attempt to add, you know, to change that law in the 1800s, and both times it was voted down. Uh, so we finally get to the point in 1870 when it passes, and uh, it was a big celebration. I read in some of the old newspapers that there were parades and all kinds of things going on. So they must have had a huge celebration up there. All right, now we get to talk about the remarkable Caesar women. Uh, what are we looking at here? Well, this is from my personal collection. I actually got it from my mother's collection. But you're seeing um, my uh, uh, Ward Caesar's uh, women uh, girl daughters, and in the front row is uh, my great grandmother Nancy Caesar, their mother. That would be Ward Caesar's wife. So what you see on the left is my great aunt Olive Caesar, and she, uh, of course, she married. But I'm going to keep stick stick with the, the the Caesar name. Behind uh, Nancy in the front is my great aunt Mary Caesar. On the far right, the right side is my grandmother Matilda Caesar, and in front is Nancy Caesar. And I know my cousins are on, so yay, cousins. <laughs> so, we, so we've gone Rachel, Timothy, Titus, George, Ward, Matilda is Ward's wife, right? And then Ray, is she in yes. the middle here? Uh, no, mother was not there. Not the picture. Okay. We, so we have Olive, her. you we mentioned have Olive uh, in that. Olive is in this picture. This one's Olive, right? Yes, that's all of Caesar. So I think this is worth taking time to read out loud, Catherine. Okay, so I told you I was doing, um, I had a phase when I was looking on the all the websites, including the Lakeville Journal, and I found several articles about my family uh, as they were, you know, matric matriculating through the, throughout the community. And uh, one of them was this article, although it says, uh, uh, Sharon PA, we, we know that's Connecticut. It says, when all of Caesar, uh, daughter of a well-known citizen of the town, Wait, Ward K, I'm saying his name, Ward K Caesar, graduated at the Sharon Casino, June, June 11th, 1914. Inhabitants of that little town witnessed the first commencement, commencement exercises to be uh, participated in by a Negro. Her essay was declared one of the best delivered in the town, and she has been requested to allow it to be printed in pamphlet form. Her subject, the progress of the Negro was well de developed. The audience consisted entirely of whites. The girl was overburdened with bou bouquets. Miss Caesar is now 17 years of age at that time and has been a resident of Sharon all her life. She has won her way into the hearts of her schoolmates and in the general esteem of those among whom she, she lived. She intends to enter Howard University in Washington, DC. I'm getting a little emotional about that. <laughs> you should. Um, so, so 
you, you, when we talk about this, you give tremendous credit to, to George and Ward, and we'll talk more about the women because their achievements stand for themselves. But, but, but why, why, what, what did George and Ward do that made them such good fathers to their daughters? I believe they had a vision for their women that they should become educated so that they could uh, um, avoid some of the pitfalls that uh, you know people, women, black women in that time fell into, and especially the only jobs around at that time for black women were domestic service. And I don't think they wanted their, their women to live that life. And I think so for some reason they must have planned and, and you know, just decided that they were gonna spend their money to have their children educated. That's, I believe that's the first generation that probably had that opportunity. But, but, but they all did, except my grandmother um, married and uh, stayed in Connecticut with her husband. So she didn't ever go off to college. So speaking of um, incredible Caesar women, and we just detailed Olive who wanted to Howard and we'll, we'll, actually, what did she do when she was at Howard really quick? Uh, oh, I, think oh, oh I have to say, yes. Olive went on to uh, graduate from Howard University. She uh, acquired a teaching job at um, Hampton University. And where well, she met her husband and my cousin's on the line here, her father. And uh, eventually they left Hampton and moved to Washington DC where she, they lived in, she had her own home for years until she, you know, she retired and passed. But she lived near the campus of Howard University where she also taught until she retired. And she was well-traveled and just a beautiful person. I knew her personally. So let's hear you talk about your mom now. Okay, I'll try. So this is my mother. I just had pulled up a few pictures to let you see her uh, over time. Um, the middle one is a picture of her as Dean of Women of Elizabeth City State University. You, you, you know what, I'm sorry for to interrupt you. Uh, what, let me set that up a little bit, Catherine, because okay. this is where the Caesars move away. When, when Ray graduated from Lakeville High School in 1936, um, she went down to Howard and that brought a close to, to Catherine's Caesar connection um, to, to the area. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later with the next slide, but go ahead, Catherine. Sorry about your mom. Okay. So, so the, the first, so that's the, the middle one is her professional, you know, picture photo that's in, you know, in the yearbook of the Elizabeth City State University and HBCU. My mother actually graduated from Howard and she worked in social work in New York City for a while. And then she got married, had my, my sister, when my, my father came home from the war, as we see, so I'm a baby boomer, uh, my sister first. And then they moved after she had my sister, they moved back to Connecticut in the New Haven area. And I remember living there with us, with, you know, there, I believe we lived in a, a little apartment or something uh, near, I, the Dixwell Avenue Church is on with me. Thank you, Dixwell. And they uh, explained to me something about the neighborhoods and where, where that was, because I, I couldn't remember. We left as young children. But anyway, that's a picture of her professional picture when she got a job in North Elizabeth. She did leave to get work in an, uh, at an HBCU in, in North Carolina. Actually, she worked at North Carolina Central first, and then she, we moved to, um, in Durham, and then we moved to Elizabeth City, where she ended up retiring, you know, in the late 70s, and she moved to D.C. And talk about education. I mean, you, you not only did two sisters go on to be, be professors and administrators at HBCUs, but you, you lived, like, your whole childhood was growing up on oh. these I grew up on those campuses. Okay, so I was, as my daughter says, we were surrounded by educated, very uh, successful, and very motivated, inspiring Black people. I, I don't know any other life. Um, so I do think it's, it's, it's good that people know that all of us do not live the same lifestyle, just like other people. I was never around any kind of, you know, ghetto, whatever you want to call it, environment. Okay, I was always brought up around educated people and my mother was always pushing for education, education, education. Where you see her there, she, I believe she had to retire. That's her little sunny uh, apartment in Washington DC on, on the Southwest uh, district, where, which is down by the waterfront. And she liked to go out and walk to the, to the um, restaurants and to the water and to the, there's a, the theaters down there. And she used to take my daughter all the time to all these kinds of things. She'll, she'll tell you maybe about that. She, right, went, so she was with my mother for quite a while. The last picture on the left, it's my mother's 80th birthday. I got to push you a little bit, just time-wise. And, and yes, yes. maybe maybe people will want to circle back with questions, and that'd be great. Okay. Just two things really quick. Um, she, uh, at the age of 70, right, she would, 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 would attend law classes at GW when she was in D.C., so she never gave up her request of okay. learning more in education. After she retired. 
And by the way, like, just note this, right? She was the Dean of Women at uh, Elizabeth State, Elizabeth City State University in the 1960s. Like that's a movie in and of itself. I can't even imagine what, what, what that must have been like. Yeah, because the 60s movement was going on. So we saw a lot of things <laughs> going on in this community. So, so uh, if, you, if you've driven the Menia to, to Sharon, you've driven by this place a million times and there's a historical marker in front that talks about the family that owned it. And the, fam, uh, the family had, you know, Henry David Thoreau and Ra Ralph Waldo Emerson and Mark Twain, who was kind of a, an intelligentsia literati hangout spot. But, but what I didn't know until two days ago when I was talking to Trina Moore and, and, and Catherine um, uh, is the history behind the Troutbeck and the tie of the Caesar family. You wanna talk about that quickly, Catherine? Sure. Um, I've always heard the name Spingarns. Uh, my mother talked about them, you know, as, as she talked about people in the family. And um, I didn't know who they were. I, I wasn't born then. I wasn't living in that area. But they grew up. My Okay, so Ward's children uh, were in the era where, when the Spingarns owned the, you know, owned the property, uh, Troutbeck. And they were very um, involved in community um events and I understand they had a you know they set up some type of uh, a media uh, park or something a media uh, celebration every year and for the community they, they put it up but this is a picture of the first meeting one of the first meetings of the NAACP so, um, so the tie to the Caesar family right oh, your great family. uncle Archie was a chauffeur yeah. for Joel Ar Stringer. Arthur my Arthur Caesar oh, Arthur, yes. and my cousin hi Artie the, he's, he was the chauffeur for years until his until he retired and and they actually he actually got a pension from them uh, up until his death and, and, who, uh, and who might he have driven back and forth from the train I'm uh, sure I, I can't imagine the people he must have met driving them from New York you know or wherever he was picking them from train stations right those people had to come in there's no train there's no buses there's no he had to go pick up all those people. So we know so Langston Hughes was there, right? We know Langston Hughes was there. We know Thurgood Thur oh, yeah, Marshall yeah. was there. Well, these people are civil rights people like W.E.B. Du Bois. My daughter looked up some of the names that are in the picture. We don't have them here or there, but they're very famous names, uh, people that are uh, instrumental in the civil rights business. And my, my, my cousin Artie is on. He says he remembers uh, driving through the gates and the big gates open up and you go down the long driveway. He was a little boy then, but he still remembers that. And the daughters were, and, and all uh, the daughters, his daughters lived there. Oh, uh, no, they didn't live. They, yes, they um, were married. One of them was married there. Ruth Caesar was married so, there. So Ward and Matilda, um, with, with the industry dying down here, up here, it, they, they moved, but Ray stayed here. And, and where do you think Ray stayed when to finish high school? Well, according to, you know, what I was told and what I uh, surmised, but then I, definitely confirmed through my daughter just recently, she said mother told her that she went to school with the Spingarn children. That's how she went to school. They had, a, now just think, Arthur was the, the chauffeur. So they had no problem, you know, getting a ride down the road because it's not that far from Lakewood. I'm sure they, they she, she, and my other cousin, I have another elder cousin that she's the eldest one that's the first cousin told me that her mother, which we've been my mother's sister, told her that when they were enrolling in schools and going to activities, she they went with the Spingarns all the time. And if there was any problem, if anybody gave them any trouble, Mrs. Spingarn came and took care of it. That's so, what she told me. So two things just to highlight there. Number one, we saw the Bissell connection earlier. Now we're seeing the Spingarn connection. Um, but 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 two, the the power of oral history and the history your your mother passed to your daughter Trina that she's sharing with you. But this might be a good time to circle back to your mother's uh, okay. your mother's name, Ray. Oh, okay. So, um, am I going to say this thing part now, or am yeah, I going to yeah, 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 let's, yeah. Let's talk about so. the naming. Okay. If you'll notice, as you'll hear me saying Arthur and George and Raymond, um, the the third uh, uh, child of uh, son of uh, George Caesar was named Raymond. My brother's name was Raymond. My mother's name is Ray. I have a couple of grandchildren that probably my cousins are on now. My nephew is on. His little young daughter has part of Ray in her name. My eldest granddaughter's name is Akia LaRay. So we, we pass the names down through the family. That's another way African-Americans have always done. So you also, also that helps to confirm the oral history. So connecting it back to Rachel, the very first slide. Yes. I yes. want to finish with your quote. Oh, this is one of my uh, latest uh, uh, favorite quotes. It says, it's an African proverb and it says, until the lion learns to write, 
Every story will glorify the hunter. Um, I promised uh, another wise Caesar descendant that she would have the last word. Okay. Uh, Tr Trina, you, did, that, did, we mess it, did we miss anything? Did we mess anything up? <laughs> no, you guys did a great job. I'm really surprised you did it 40 something minutes. <laughs> 200 years, I wasn't sure. <laughs> 300 years. 300 years, yeah. yes, yes. No, I, I think that's absolutely phenomenal. And I love the African problem. I told my mom that that's something that all of us family members should really probably take on because it's so significant. The idea is that history has been told through one lens for so long. And there's so much more history to be told, particularly with black people and their contributions, uh, relationships, to American history. And so we have to get in there and tell the story. What my mom didn't say, which I'm gonna say, finish with saying thank you to her, is that when my grandmother passed, who people that know her and have loved her and the people have heard the stories about her, um, she was an amazing, amazing person, person who was yelling to the hilltops, don't forget this, don't forget this, somebody look at this. She really was trying to get everybody and she always was keeping the rest of the family connected. So I was a young girl connected to my New York family. Even if I didn't see all of them, I knew who they were. If it was my cousin Susan in California, my cousin Doll, I knew who my grandmother was connected to. So this is phenomenal for me as a young person. But my mom took 10 years. You guys heard 45 minutes. 10 years of putting information and traveling to Connecticut, going into uh, 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 behind dark places and looking for documents and doing this to make sure that our history uh, continue to live on in perpetuity. And so mommy, I just wanna say to that, thank you very much. And um, we continue to do right by you and our descendants and our, um, you know, our great, great sixth, fifth for me, great, great grandfather, um, as we continue to move on and do well and continue to contribute to uh, this American country. That's it. And, and Trina's doing it. She's an attorney down in Texas doing immigration law. So she's on the front line. So she, she's still continuing their contributions to, to America. So thank you very much, guys. Um, I'm blown away and I value your friendship so much, Catherine. And I thank you for making this connection and also thank the boys for the, all their beautiful work on the film. It is so moving. When so I first saw it, I just broke down. That's just a rough cut. We're going to work on that and we're going to make it more professional. Um, okay. But but that's, uh, we thought that you guys might like to see that. So are there any questions for Catherine? There, Go ahead, Ben. A couple of questions in the chat room uh, as well, some of which have been answered, but you might want to just take a look at them. I did. I think, um, I think Trina did a good job hammering all of them. I mean, uh, I think Ellen was getting ready to say something. Oh, Ellen, I'm sorry. She's muted. Ellen Emerson, oh. Eileen. Oh, I see. Eileen, I'm sorry. No, thank you. I was just pointing out the bunch of questions in the chat. Uh, okay. Ben, you had a question. Do you want to unmute yourself, Ben Holly? Yes. Hi. Uh, I'm just happy to be able to get together again with Catherine. Uh, Catherine and I are DNA cousins. Yes. And I'm still trying to figure out how we're connected. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna hog the microphone, but <laughs> I am. Well, we are descended from soldiers in the 29th Regiment. Right. Uh, that's out of Connecticut. I'm gonna stop this video so you can see me in uniform. Yes, 29th Connecticut. That's Civil me. War. That's him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I mean, Karen. Catherine, when are you gonna be in Connecticut so we can hook up? Um, we, well, we're both in Maryland now, aren't we? Well, I, I'm in yeah, Texas. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it. We will. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you, Ben. And you as well. Yeah, and, and ben, just to, to your point, the Connecticut 29th is something that a lot of uh, nutmeggers don't know. That, that Massachusetts 54th was the movie from Glory fame, but Connecticut had uh, the Connecticut 29th, and, and they, they were, they were uh, just as valorous as the Massachusetts 54th. And Ben was instrumental in an organization that funded and raised money and, and funded a statue, a monument to them that's put up in the, the part, one of the parks, I think it's, I, I don't remember the, uh, sorry, New Haven people, in the park. Uh, the, the Fair, Haven. Haven. Fair Haven. Fair Haven, okay. 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 Eileen Epperson, did you have a question? I was wondering um, if there's some confusion about whether Rachel was a Native American or Black or, or both or 
I would, I would say mixed race because I mean, who knows how you you know back then you know everybody was mixing up and you know yeah. gotta gotta agree, we gotta learn to accept that. <laughs> um, Shirley oh. Turner, can you hear oh. me, Shirley? We can, Shirley. Go ahead. Oh, I just want to say thank you, Catherine. Um, this is wonderful. I'm Shirley Turner. I'm the oldest daughter of Ruth Hope. Oh yes, hi Shirley. Yeah. Said, Mother well, talks about you all, all the time. She used to oh, go visit that's you. Yeah. That's your cousin, Trina. Yeah, hi, hi. And I remember Aminia and everything so well. Oh, and yes. and um, of course, my grandfather was yes. Arthur Caesar. Yes. And yes. So thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, I don't welcome. know. Can you see me? I don't know. No, I don't see you. I don't see your... Um, the, okay. the camera might not be on. I guess you don't. Are you? Do you see the video crossed out? That's probably what it is. Oh, okay. I don't know how to do that. But anyway, <laughs> mommy, while we're waiting for cousin Caesar, one of the questions that was asked, and I think that goes back to about um, uh, Rachel Caesar, was about the um, the mixed race, the the you know the Native American or not, and then where we came from. I'd answered a little bit about the Pequot because I didn't remember how you know you had kind of talked a little bit about that, but that's a whole nother line to go down to kind of research other more, 10 more years. Yes. Um, but, but, explain, right. but can you okay. explain why we, somebody asked, how are they free? How is it that this side of the family was free? Can you touch on that, please? Well, there's a, my understanding is um, according to the laws back then and, and also during slavery times, uh, there were statutes that said the children follow the status of the mother. She was Native American. She was free. She was, you know, she was not a, a citizen of the of, of the United States, and so her children would have been free, coming down. Also, um, I might say I got a I got a shout out to Regina Mason. Uh, we both have the same oral history. This is true story. We hadn't even met each other. Okay, we did meet at the induction ceremony in 2019, but we both had the same oral history about the Native American um, ancestor. And it's, uh, it's also written in her family Bible that Rachel's name is above Timothy Caesar's name as, you, as it comes down in the Bible. So, I mean, that's another f part of, of history that we use as documentation. And Re Regina, I, it's so, I've never met you formally, but I know that the story of, of William Grimes, your ancestor, will you, if you can throw in the box, the link to your website in there, and Regina made a movie of, of her, of her Catherine voyage almost to find, William Grimes, who is from Litchfield, nearby Litchfield. And that is an amazing story um, as well. It's called Gina's Journey, and it's on Prime, and it's on <laughs> <laughs> Read the book. OK. I have <laughs> unmuted myself. Can you all hear me? Yes. This is Regina. Hi. OK, I'm working on a device that I'm not familiar with. Okay. So, And I, you know, I'm not zoom savvy but anyway Catherine you did a fantastic job every time I listen to you I learn something new and fascinating about the Caesar line so I want to thank you for your dedication and hard work I mean we we know what perseverance yeah. looks like yeah. and yes you spoke about Rachel Rachel is indeed in the family bible and she appears to be the progenitor of the Caesar line um by the way that she is situated up front on the family, in the family Bible. And I, in the oral history yeah. that my Aunt Catherine, isn't it so ironic that <laughs> Catherine yeah. and I never met, but, but uh, you know, <laughs> I have an Aunt Catherine in, in the family. So when we connected and you sounded so much family, like family, you look like family. I just <laughs> could, this was just unbelievable. But what I know from the oral history is that there were Pequot uh, Native Americans in the family line. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about Rachel. Mm -hmm. That name just appeared merely in the Bible, but we didn't know her story. Mm -hmm. So I did the same research that you, Catherine, have done and found her in, in Dartmouth. Um, found her one sentence obituary, found her listed as Native American and also uh, as Negro. So we've come across some of the same uh, documents, but um, 
Rachel, for me, is still this incredible mystery. I, I, like you, Catherine, want to know her story. And, you know, women in, in, in history tend to be anonymous, even more so the African-American or even Native American mm-hmm. woman. Right. Uh, so um, we- can you, can you confirm that Clarissa Mary, Clarissa Mary William Grimes? Yes, Clarissa Caesar is the daughter of Timothy Caesar and she married William Grimes. Yes, yes that you, is. Uh, Tina, would you mind if I really quickly summarize like a quick thumbnail of William Grimes for everyone? And, and then okay. you could tell me if I got anything wrong or add anything, but oh, William sure, Grimes is remarkable. He's a remarkable story. He wrote um, a, a fugitive, uh, na- fugitive enslaved man's uh, narrative. He was, I think that was the first one. I escaped from Georgia and ended up coming up to Litchfield and having a barbershop in the stable. And he would take mm-hmm. kids back and forth from the Litchfield schools to the train station and whatnot. And one of the girls he was taking back to the train was from Georgia. And she said, you look familiar. And she went back and she told people in Georgia that William Grimes was in Litchfield. So he was captured, brought back down to Georgia, um, went on trial, right? And then did he sell his rights to his book? And that's how he got manumitted, Regina? Oh, wow. What an incredible story you tell. Uh, there, <laughs> there, there are threads of that that um, are true. And then there are things about that particular story that I've heard that I have not been able to corroborate. But let me just say this. William Grimes um, was spotted right away when he came first to New York City. And his story really illustrates how small the scope of the country was in his day. And um, there was, he, first of all, let me backtrack because I, I really don't want to take the no, floor I, so here. I, I just want to I show get, how, how, how Clarissa and William Grimes ended up marrying. Like it's, you talk about the small scope. You look at the movie, that's, the, that's my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, look. William mm-hmm. Grimes worked for, or um, for at least six, had six different masters in Savannah, Georgia, and they were all connected. Mm-hmm. They would just, uh, what word? He was like working with these six men, passed from one mm-hmm. owner to the next, but they were all interconnected and they all had dealings in New York mm-hmm. and even Connecticut. Even one of his Savannah uh, masters was from Connecticut. And he, so there was, it was quite easy for him to be spotted by these men from uh, um, Savannah, Georgia. And not only that, even uh, Virginia connections and so forth. But to speak to the story about um, uh, a, a young woman from the uh, women's school in Litchfield um, spilling the beans or, or telling on him. I don't know that that is necessarily a true story. It is a story that has been circulating, but I have not been able to corroborate that. So if you have uh, some uh, evidence to this, I would like to hear about it. <laughs> but nonetheless, Clarissa is, or was, William Grimes's wife. And I stem from their youngest daughter who survived, uh, who was uh, a tragedian in the San Francisco Bay Area. And she came to California at the height of the, the gold rush. And there is a myth that the family lost touch and so forth. And because his wife, Clarissa, eventually came to the Bay Area as well, but they were well connected. They, uh, I found sh- ship records where they sailed back and forth to um, Connecticut, to New Haven. And so they never severed their ties with William Grimes and the family that remained in, in um Connecticut. And with that, I'm going to be quiet and turn it over to you, Catherine. It's 5.05 now, Lawrence. Um, 
I, one sign of a good presentation is where no one leaves at the end. Uh, and there's still 87 people here. So Lawrence, if, if you don't mind, uh -huh. I don't know if it, uh, I, I'd like to let Catherine uh, answer some more questions. I, I think we go as long as we feel like it. At a certain point, obviously a lot of people will depart, but we're not there yet. So yes, I agree. Oh, okay. Any other questions? Well, there was another question um, that's come up a couple of times. The article about um, the 17-year-old, yeah. I forgot her name, who graduated. Oh, the top of oh. it said Sharon P.A., yeah. not Sharon C.T. Yeah, and I said that in the beginning, that that was an error. Ah, oh, got it. The Thank you, that. Somebody, yeah, she definitely was in Sharon, Connecticut. She was okay. graduated well, from Mom, you know. Mom, somebody had mentioned in the chat that there was a Sharon, Pennsylvania. And there is a share in Pennsylvania. That's why they were wondering whether or not that actually was some maybe okay. an issue. But um, if you could just even speak to again, going back to the records, Ma, that's that's one of the issues we have about you know 100 versus 104 mm -hmm. Sharon PA versus Sharon Connecticut. Mm -hmm. But then it says the casino Sharon. How difficult it is with the record um, and, well, and making sure you cook. Go ahead. It wasn't difficult for me because I already knew uh, who all of Caesar was, and I knew they sh they came from Sharon, Connecticut. I didn't have a problem with it. I find errors in records all the time. The further you, you go back, you'll find errors in the census records. I've had my mother uh, uh, listed as a boy. I've had my mother, my grandmother, listed as white, and her her mother listed as black. Um, I mean, it gets mixed up on the you know. It, it's human error. Okay, it's human error. And oh, I've got to dispel this 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 latest that the, the boys found. Okay. Oh, thank you to the boys. Thank you so much for all your work. They, they mentioned to me when they, oh, and this is my grandson. <laughs> um, the boys mentioned to me that they found records that said uh, that Timothy Caesar's, the land was owned by, uh, the Caesar Brook campsite was owned by um, a free black slave. And that, the, uh, you know, he, and he had, that's how he got the land. And the folk, folk people tell a tale about a, a lady from the city going there and asking questions about the, uh, the diamonds that were on her property. And he said, oh yes, there are diamonds, but they're on the backs of rattlesnakes. <laughs> so that story has been, I, the first time I, it, the first uh, uh, evidence that it was printed was in 1956. I told the boys that it's not true. He was not a free slave. It's just one of those folk tales that gets passed on. But the, 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 uh, the Hartford Current has printed that 1956, I saw all those. I saw all those records I, when I was doing research. 1991, and also again in 2017. So I want to dispel that story right now. <laughs> so, and, and you know, I think Trina's point's a good one, right? I mean, the, yeah. the, 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 the records for Black folks and ind Indigenous folks didn't matter as much to the record keepers. So they, they were rushed, they were errors, they were, they were sloppy. Um, we could show you we, I mean, we debated putting them in, in the slides, some of the language they used to describe um, uh, members of, the, of that community. I mean, it, it's, it's deplorable, but, but that, so therefore there's a question in the chat and this might be a good time talking about your, uh, has the Daughters of the American Revolution asked to work with you? Mm -hmm. and, and the problems with like that, that, that brings. Okay, um, I, I do have a, uh, a little unique uh, story. Uh, recently, I was contacted by the Daughters of the American Re Revolution about participating in a new initiative that initiative they have going on called Daughters of Color. And they're trying to, and, it, and you'll see ads on television and, and all over. And they're saying that they're trying to show that they have changed uh, because they had some problems back in the 40s um, when they did not allow Marian Anderson to sing a, in mm -hmm. Constitution Hall, which is their home you know, headquarters. Uh, and so a lot of people had issue with that. Uh, and, and so, and also they were not, actually they were, yeah, so they, and they, they also were not allowing black women to, to join. Um, so fast forward, they are now saying they, they are open and, and ready to, to, to bring in as many African-American women or women of color. That's why it's called Daughters of Color. So I was asked to um, participate in a luncheon that was just an open discussion about, you know, what, who, what, who we were, what our stories were and whatnot, and then to explore you know the possibility of joining um i participated in the one of the initial one in when they were having the continental congress um that weekend um it was all very virtually it was supposed to be at a restaurant but it turned into virtual so at the end of that um there was a i didn't know this was gonna happen but there was a nbc report on on that um 
that showed a picture that was taken of all of us on the screen, like on this Zoom. So you see everybody on the top and all that. So there was a picture promoted by the Daughters of America Revolution showing how many daughters of color they had. Um, and at some point, someone asked me about joining. And I said, at that time, I was focusing in on honoring my ancestors' service in the military. Uh, because I understand the difference between, what, what, what I understand the difference between a patriot and a, and a veteran is, the veteran actually, my ancestor, I have his muster rolls. He walked up and down the highlands, up the, the Hudson River Valley, and he, he held a gun and he was shot at and he survived the winters and he survived, you know, starving. And um, he, he has no gravestone. He had no gravestone and no burial record in, in Grove Street, but I already had done research and knew he was buried in there because he died in 1822. And that was the only, that was the, the official, uh, that was the first public actually grave uh, uh, cere 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 cemetery in the United States. Uh, so I decided to write a letter to the Veterans Department and um, put, you know, and, and ask for a gravestone to be uh, placed there. And that's what uh, prompted me to decide to do the ceremony last year with the Sixth Connecticut, and I surely appreciate them. But also with the DIR, there is a continuing effort to include more Black women. I decided that my focus, want, I wanted to stay focused on my family story and especially on Timothy Caesar's service. So and, I have and, not yet decided. And something that was difficult, Catherine, was that the requirements that the DAI requires mm -hmm. is just records that aren't necessarily available for Black It's people. a lineage society. All lineage societies may, mean that you have to check off every box for every vital record. It, 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 there's no way. And I, and I decided at some point when I looked into it, and I went there, I actually went to their headquarters at one point when I first started researching. They're right down the street, because I live near Washington, DC in Maryland. And I went right down the street to the DAR. They had nothing on him. Um, and and uh, actually, National Archives had no pension records. I thought that was very odd. But what happened was because on his, since I don't have his discharge papers, I can't read it to you, but his discharge paper indicated that he was transferred to the invalid uh, uh, corps after he was deemed um, no longer fit for service nor in the garrison. And he, at that point, it also says that he is eligible for all of the benefits that were afforded by the Congress at that point. So he must have received, now you'll see the pay bond was almost a promise, like, like you know, US savings bonds. I mean, you didn't get your money because the treasury was, we were broke. <laughs> so you came to and signed on the bond every quarter and you got some interest, you know, off of it until, you know, you got your pay. But he didn't really receive a pension, um, you know, a full pension, like, like it. in fact, he was better off than waiting because they didn't really give the, the veterans pension. They didn't pass the, the pension law until after 1818. Most of them were dying off by then. He died in 1822. So, you know, it, it wasn't easy, but it wasn't an easy life afterwards. And that's why, again, I'm, I'm really so, sometimes so proud and so, you know, um, um, I can't ex imagine how they made it, you know, from Timothy into Salisbury and then were able to, you know, manage to survive. Now, you know, as again, I think the connections with the Revolutionary War people, Bissell's, Hotchkiss, they're, they're full of, there's all those captains and whatnot and other prominent white people. That's how I think they were able to make connections and survive. All right, well, listen, always leave them wanting more, right, Catherine? <laughs> okay. And, uh, Lawrence, uh, again, thank you for, for letting us do this. 76 people left. I, I think next time I get out of the way, we just let this uh, <laughs> turn this over to, to my friend. And I hope I didn't leave anybody out, but thanks to you, everybody for participating and uh, I hope you enjoyed the story. Thank you, everyone, for Thank being you. here. Uh, all of you, all your relatives, friends. I just want to say I did forget to mention the uh, Salisbury Association Historical Society as one of the sponsors, as well as um, Sharon Library, Hotchkiss Library. So I just want to apologize for leaving that out. Uh, yes. And uh, we'd love to participate in another one of your family discussions, Catherine. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. You heard it. Everybody heard that, right? <laughs> and when we finally get her up here after COVID, we are going to have a July 4th celebration. Oh, of okay. Wow, that would be great. Wouldn't his grandsons? Here's my grandson. This is my techie grandson. He's my he's my personal te techie consultant right now. Because if he wasn't here, we wouldn't be on this camera. <laughs> this is like hey, hey, Ronan. The other, yeah. ones, the other one came in on Trina's uh, 
Hey, Ronan, yeah. I pledge that the Salisbury Association Historical Society will be a partner with you in that reception. All right, awesome. Make sure they bring food. <laughs> Lawrence, hey. you look at me, you see me. You don't think food's gonna be involved? Thanks, Lou. Thank you so much, Catherine. That thank, really thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ronan. It was, it was, it was, it was terrific. It was wonderful. Thank, thank you, Ronan. Thank you, Lawrence. Bye, guys. Well done. Thank you. Thanks, Mom. Thank you. Thanks, Mommy. Bye, everybody. Thank you, uh, Mommy. It was wonderful. Hi, thank you, cousin. Thank you, cousin. All the cousins. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Love thank you, family. Thank you. Fantastic <laughs> job. Thank you. Thank you. Can't wait to watch the movie. Yes. <laughs> Good night. Absolutely. Good night. Night. Good night. How do I close this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.